Welcome to another edition of Rock Creek Online. We're so glad that you joined us again this week. We are especially thankful for those of you that's been so good, so generous, so faithful with your financial support because it enables us to continue to expand our ministries so that we're, we can reach more people with the good news during these unprecedented times. Today, we're gonna to continue the series that we've been in for a while now, focusing on a tiny little phrase that appears again and again in scripture, but God. For the last several weeks, we've been looking at real life experiences of men and women in the scriptures who were faced with adversity, who had a but God encounter, and it changed the course of their life. Now, as you can see, we're outside for this opening segment of this week's message, and there's a couple reasons for that. One, I like sweater vests, and it's a sweater vest morning, and so I'm thankful for that. But the real reason we're here is because this is an appropriate backdrop for the but God encounter that we're gonna be talking about today. Let me explain what I'm talking about. In the book of Philippians, Paul is writing back to the Christians in Philippi, and he's virtually giving them a medical report about a man named Epaphroditus, whom they loved dearly, but had found out had become very ill. And so Paul is writing, and this is what he says. He was indeed ill. In fact, he almost died, but God had mercy. I, I chose this site today because of the building that's behind me. If you're from Central Arkansas, you've already recognized it. It's Baptist Medical Center. This building has stood on this campus for decades now and is a, a monument that is uh, filled with so many memories for so many people, some pleasant, some painful. For instance, some of you have a pleasant memory of this place because you walked out those doors with a new baby in your arms. Your child had been born here and had taken their first breath inside those walls. But for others, many others, unfortunately, they, they walked out of those doors in a completely different mood. It was a somber mood. They were sorrowful. They were sad. They had lost someone. Someone that they loved very dearly had taken their final breath in that building. And as they, they walked out the doors that day, in those initial moments of loss and pain and sorrow, they thought about a future without that person, and some of them may have even thought, I think I'm going to die. But God had mercy. You see, this hilltop in West Little Rock is a place where every day life hangs in the balance. And so I believe inch for inch, this parcel of land has more but God encounters than any other place in the state of Arkansas. I'm gonna ask Mark, if he will, to pray for us today as we take a deep dive into this but God had mercy message. Father, thank you so much that, that we learn mercy from you and we can find mercy in you. So help us in our relationship with you today, especially as we learn from your word, that, that it's key that we look to you, uh, God, for, for all of the of the power and the emotion of the need of, of getting mercy in the times that, uh, that we need it most. Teach us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today's text comes from uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians, and it's actually a very powerful and emotional paragraph in the midst of Paul's letter. And when word had spread that a letter from Paul had arrived from Rome, Paul is in prison, and when word spreads in Philippi that they've received a letter from Paul, I imagine the people gathered quickly because uh, not only were they concerned about Paul's well-being, but they had also heard their friend Epaphroditus had become very ill and were anxious to hear how he was doing as well. So when the letter came and they were uh, all there and somebody was going to read it out loud, they were tuned in when they heard the name Epaphroditus. You just know that the people leaned in a little closer to hear the news. And this is what Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him. And now on him, not on him only, but also on me, despair me sorrow 
upon sorrow. Now, you fast forward to the 21st century, and Paul's report today would probably have sounded something like this. Epaphroditus uh, is a very sick man, and uh, honestly, uh, it didn't look good, and we didn't think he was going to make it, but he almost died. However, obviously God had other plans. He's doing better. He's going to make it, and when he gets a little stronger, we'll be sending him home. You know, you know there was jubilation when that report was read in Philippi. Now, Mark, as, as you know, uh, I did the opening statement down at the campus at Baptist Hospital. And, uh, and I did that in part because as pastors, you and I have spent a little time there. Yeah. Not just that hospital, but other hospitals. We've spent a lot of time in uh, hospital waiting rooms, sitting with families who are anxiously waiting to get word from uh, a surgery or from a lab test. They want to know how the surgery went. They want to know uh, what the results of that test were. And uh, you know that when, uh, uh, when that door opens and, and the doctor walks in that room, mm-hmm. uh, the air changes, that room changes. Yeah. Uh, the, the little superficial chatter that has been going on stops, the stories are suspended, and everybody often stand up and lean in because they listen with great intensity. And, uh, and so here's the question. You know, there, there, there's a lot of people who aren't very good listeners. In fact, I've come to believe that most people aren't really great listeners, but all of that, even bad listeners, changes in a hospital waiting room. Why, why is that? I that, mean, we could only question. wish, we yeah. could only wish they listened that intently to us on Sunday, that's right? That's right, that's right. <laughs> but everybody changes, I think, because they are wanting to know, okay, what he's about to say is going to impact me immediately. Oh, that's good. You know, and, and, Two, you know, once he says it, he's gone or she's gone, you know, and that's it. And so they want to know how this is going to impact me immediately and I better catch every word of it right now or I won't get another chance. Yeah. I, I, I like. I mean, they're impacted. That's yeah. that's it. It's yeah. the, the it's a, an emotional attachment, a, a great intensity that's there, and uh, and that brings us to this week's but God moment when God has mercy, which we will see today is an incredibly intense feeling that God has for us. Now, Chuck Swindoll, and I know that you are a big fan mm-hmm. of Chuck Swindoll as I am as well, uh, said his sister. Uh, some time back, ask him a question he'd never been asked before. So I'm going to ask you that question, and that is, what is your favorite feeling? (laughs) What is your favorite feeling? (laughs) I'm not not going to give you a heads up on what what, Swindoll said. but Yeah, yeah. I I would think that um, it's when, oh, now, I I got it. When one of our grandchildren runs to me to hug. Oh, you know, yeah, that that right now, that would be it. That's yeah, it. That That's good. It. Yeah. That's a great feeling. You know, uh, Swindoll said his great feeling was, and I, I can resonate with this and you will be able to as well, is uh, the feeling of accomplishment. Mm-hmm. He said one of his favorite words is finished. It's yeah. like when you've, you, when you've checked everything off the list and you're done, you yeah. know, you've, you've yeah. written the book and you've done your last, uh, last page of the book, all of that. When you've prepared the sermon, and it's finally, you know, finished, and uh, that's it. But Swindoll said that he turned around, turned the tables on his sister, and asked her what her favorite feeling was. Mm -hmm. And she said her favorite feeling is relief. Now, what a great answer that is when you think about it. You know, relief is defined as the removal or lightening of something oppressive, painful, or distressing. You know, when we're in pain, physically or emotionally, relief means the pain subsides, it, it, uh, it gets less, it calms us down. And in reality, relief is a great synonym for mercy. We're all familiar with the word mercy. Uh, I had at least two people use it in my office this past week. Uh, it's commonly used. People are always flippantly saying, Lord, have mercy. But what exactly are we asking God for when we say, God, have mercy? Well, let's find out. And we're going to, I've got three questions that I want to ask today as we sort of diagnose God's mercy. Number one, what exactly is God's mercy? That's the first question. What exactly is God's mercy? Well, it's one of those things that is hard sometimes for us to define, but we know when we need it. I actually think the mercy of God is one of the most 
uh, precious realities about God and His character, and yet it is one of the most tragically misunderstood and undervalued traits about God. Now, I'm not sure any biblical writer had a better understanding and appreciation for mercy than the Apostle Paul did. I mean, it was acutely personal for him, and so it is not surprising that he gives us one of the clearest glimpses into the mercy of God in the book of Romans, which I often refer to as the gospel according to Paul. It is his perspective of the whole New Testament, of, of the coming of Jesus Christ. And this is what he says in Romans. Is there injustice with God? Absolutely not. For he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then, it does not depend on human will or effort, but on God who shows mercy. Now, to, in other words, God's mercy is an expression of the heart of God that aches to relieve the miseries of those He loves. It's an intense kind of feeling, very much like we experience in a waiting room. There's, this is directly affecting me. It's, connect, it's strong feelings. Now, and here's the other question, Mark, I want to ask you. You know, in, among critics in, in our world, in our religious world, among Christians, there's a lot of people who discount anything that has anything to do with feelings. Uh, it, it's a, like it's a faith versus feelings kind of thing, and, and they just... They, they just discount feelings altogether. But um, obviously, our faith doesn't totally discount feelings. Aren't they a valid part of who we oh, are yeah. and who God made us to be? Yeah, and, and our faith produces feelings. Yeah. You know, and so we, we just got, the, the only thing in dealing with feelings is you've got to ask yourself, all right, where did that come from? Hmm. What caused that feeling to take place in us? And because faith produces feelings, they work hand in hand. Yeah. You know, of course, you don't want it to be all feelings, okay? <laughs> yeah. But you want to you live by your faith, not live by your feelings, because you live by your feelings. It might have been pepperoni pizza you ate last night, you know? So you, <laughs> yeah. you got to be careful about that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I think if you go to the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew term for mercy is one of my favorite words in the Hebrew Bible. It's chesed. It is one of the most magnificent Hebrew words in the entire Bible, and it's often translated loving kindness mm -hmm. or mercy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay? And both of those, it's, it's an emotional response to the needs of others. It means to feel the pain of another. That's why the King James Version often uses uh, this or captures this feeling by the word bowels and the bowels of mercy. It is captured in the New Testament with this word compassion to describe Jesus' feelings, how he churned with intense feeling when he saw somebody in need and he yearned to help. He wanted to relieve that pain, that sorrow, that suffering, whatever he saw. You know, mercy is not merely a feeling, but it is a feeling. It's a feeling that is so intense it spawns action. Mercy in theory is absolutely meaningless. But when you trace that word through the Old Testament, you find out it's not just theory. It is a feeling that prompts action. It's active compassion of God demonstrated to those who are miserable. I mean, Jesus became mercy in the New Testament, the embodiment of God's mercy. So what is mercy? This is it. Write it there in your notes. God's mercy is our source of relief. God's mercy is our source of relief. Chuck Swindoll said, mercy is God's ministry to the miserable. You know, when we are in time of deep distress and God activates his compassion to bring about relief, we have experienced the mercy of God. Uh, you know, it's... In Lamentations, of all places, mm -hmm. it, it, or, or, well, I'm going to get to Lamb. First, I want to go to Daniel. It, it, Daniel says, we do not make request of you because we are righteous, 
but because of your great mercy. It goes back to what Paul said, but yeah. Daniel said that hundreds of years before. You know, in the passage I read from Romans just a moment ago, Paul is saying it's not because of anything we've done, it's just because of God's compassion. And Daniel here says, you know, we don't ask for this because we're good, we ask because you are You're good. good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and 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 that's so important. You know, God is a mercy having God. That's what that literally means in Daniel. Mercy is His nature, but God's mercy not only shows us who He is, but also tells us something essential about who we are, and that is we need God's mercy. Which leads us to the second question, and that is why do I need God's mercy? Well, the easy answer is we live in a fallen world. And thus, we often find ourselves miserable, in miserable situations. We need God's mercy because of our misery. And mysteriously and magnificently, the mercy of God brings the relief that we so desperately need. So that being the case, Mark, I, I, th this is another question, is why do you not hear? And of course, I don't know what you always are asking God for, and we don't always say our prayers out loud or audibly. But you know, I think about how many times I hear someone pray, and I seldom hear anybody praying for God's mercy. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we pray for God's protection, we pray for uh, strength, we pray for healing, we pray, but we seldom pray for God's mercy. What, why is it that that's not really one at the top of you our think, list? You think it's because we think we already got it, so we don't need it, we don't know what all it means, I we don't, don't know. know what all it entails, it's pretty interesting. You, know, you mentioned earlier, uh, it was key, part of defining mercy, how many times it's it's introduced to us throughout the Old Testament. Yeah. And I thought about it, Psalm 23, the last verse of Psalm 23, mm -hmm. shall uh, goodness and loving kindness, goodness and mercy, that's the, that me. word, yeah. shall follow me all the days of my life. And and the, it's I, I think that a lot of times we just think, okay, it's there, we've mm -hmm. had it, mm -hmm. we don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm but it really is something we need every day. Yeah, yeah. We, we, and yes. we're gonna to get to yeah. that, the, the, the daily allotment of mercy, but you know, it's almost as if we take it for granted. Granted, very much for granted. And, and, yeah. uh, and yet, it's a, a, a huge need that yeah. every one of us have, and, and we're gonna talk about that, why, why I need that. I mean, you could go through the Bible and can probably identify a dozen or more specific kinds of misery where God's mercy brings relief. But most of that misery can be summed up in, in three uh, categories, and that's what I want to do here. The first category there in your notes is, I, I need relief for sickness. You know, remember this was the but God issue Paul addressed in today's focal passage in Philippians. He said, indeed, Epaphroditus was ill, mm -hmm. and he almost died, mm -hmm. but God mm -hmm. had mercy. You know, Paul is convinced that had God not intervened in given relief and extended mercy, that Epaphroditus would not have made it. Mm. He would have died. Uh, sickness is a, a universal problem, and no one is immune. And if we've learned nothing else over the past two years, surely it is now apparent that all mankind is subject to sickness, and this has been the uh, true throughout history. I mean, Jesus is the mercy of God made flesh, and he was and is the mercy of God to us. Fittingly, if you go through the Gospels, the most prominent request made of Jesus was have mercy on me. Yeah. Over yeah, and about. over and over again. We could spend the rest of time talking about that. In Matthew 20, two blind men crying out for mercy. In Matthew chapter 15, uh, it's a, a distraught mother at the, uh, at the end of her rope. She, she's run out of options, begging for mercy for her, her demon-possessed daughter. In Matthew 17, it's a, a father begging for mercy for his son who's been plagued by seizures. And in Luke 17, there are 10 lepers who cry out at the top of their lungs, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. You know, we could go on and on, but you get the point. We need God's mercy to provide relief for our sickness. Now, I, it's not just sickness. I also need, uh, I need relief for sorrow. You see, when Paul, back to our uh, focal passage, when Paul gave an update on Epaphroditus' condition and cited the mercy of God, he also made it plain that he saw this as God showing him, Paul, 
great mercy as well. Paul was spared the tremendous grief and heartache by Epaphroditus getting well and not dying. It says, but God had mercy on him. And not on him only, Paul said, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. You know, people need mercy when grief invades our lives. It's, it's easy to pass over this too quickly, especially if you haven't had to deal with a session of grief yourself recently. But at some point, everyone does. And when you do, remember God has a special mercy for those who are left as widows or widowers and those who lose children. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mark another question. God's mercy doesn't mean... When someone dies, mm -hmm. we pray for them, and someone dies, it does not mean, does it, that God's mercy wasn't for them? I mean, what, you know, a person, you know, it, they prayed for Epaphroditus, God showed him mercy and he lived. Yeah. But we've all prayed for people and they died. Yeah. So does that mean God didn't show mercy? No, I think that it means that God's mercy for one person is different than it is yeah. in that same need in another person's life. Just like... I, yeah. We all take different medications based mm -hmm. upon whatever that need is. Yeah, and and the you know like last week and dealing with with the the blind man, his definition for what uh, what mercy uh, meant for him was he wanted to see, so that really so that he could be a you know the God, the Lord gave him sight so that he could be a testimony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but for some people, the testimony is in how they die. You yeah. know, how they never get well. Right. You know, what, how you live with being sick. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and, and I think that that's true because what the, we go back to the definition that, that, of mercy is relief. And, you know, that, that anxiety that maybe you have been given a terminal dis, yeah. uh, diagnosis. And, uh, and so you're anxious about that. God, and you may, you may actually die from that, but God's mercy can help relieve that anxiety about the approaching death. Yeah, as you learn to deal with yeah. it, as you learn to live with it. Yeah, And Absolutely. God's mercy might be communicating His mercy through you in that illness. Yeah, to somebody else. Because I, I know Man, it's, it's, a, I, it's a it's a powerful thing. You know, how how many different facets it can work. Yeah. God can work through. That. Yeah, because I, I mean, we we did the opening segment at, at Baptist Hospital, and yeah. and some people. Uh, walked out of that, those doors having left someone who took their final breath mm -hmm. uh, there and uh, as my, my own dad died there. Mm -hmm. and, but I don't feel like uh, God didn't give me mercy. He gave me mercy to go, mm -hmm. keep going, to move yeah. on, to, to deal with my sorrow. Yeah. And, so, yeah. and, and, and that's, that's really what this is all about. Uh, you may not be able to define mercy, but you sure do know when you need it. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I, I wrote a short note to a, a woman who in our church had recently lost her husband. And she was one of those who came through the drive through event we had uh, last week. And uh, she told me, she said, Greg, when I got your note, I took a picture of that and sent it to one of my relatives. I mean, uh, we just have no idea mm -hmm. of how when people are struggling with grief uh, and are miserable in that grief, how they are like a sponge soaking up any expression of kindness, loving kind, mercy that you can offer because it helps relieve the pain. You know, mercy is giving relief to the miserable and God can use you and me to express his mercy. But the greatest need we have is, is not our sickness, for mercy, it's not our sickness, and it's not our sorrow. The greatest need we have is relief for my sin. Uh, now, this is serious, so serious that God in his mercy sent his only son to earth to provide relief for you and me because all have sinned and fallen short. I want you to listen to uh, this passage of scripture from Ephesians chapter two. And, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. The connecting link between a holy God and a sinful person is God's love, His loving kindness, which activates His grace, 
which in turn sets in motion His mercy so that they become like dominoes that sort of bump up against one another. And as they bump in and have that kind of chain reaction, it impacts us. He, he loves us not because of something in ourselves, but He loves us because of something in Himself. And in His love, He demonstrates His grace, which brings forgiveness. And then grace prompts mercy that relieves my guilt. You know, the magnificent thing uh, about God's mercy is that it is demonstrated in the offender as well as the victim. And this was what separates man's mercy from God's mercy. Mark, you, you pointed this out in the opening message of this series about Jonah. Uh, Jonah did not want the Ninevites to experience God's mercy. Right. Jonah was well aware of God's nature, and he knew God's nature was he would forgive them if they admitted their sin and asked for forgiveness, that God would extend mercy to them, but Jonah didn't want that. Why are we so stingy about something we ourselves need so desperately? I, I think that, that you know Jonah would be a great example, like you said, because he, he didn't like them, obviously. <laughs> he wanted, because he didn't like them, he wanted God not to like them. Yeah, and and Jonah knew what it was like to have those moments of mercy in your life, and he didn't want them to have any kind of relief at all. It's almost like it's a it's a it's, it's kind of a revenge, revenge deal, isn't it? Yeah, you know, yeah. Sometimes grudge yeah. deal. With and, people. and it's a and it's a huge uh, revelation of the condition of our own heart. Yeah. You know, and we're so mean. It, it, yeah, we're we're, mean we, we, we are mean yeah. people. You know, and and, and that's that. You know, when the offender realizes his or her wrongdoing, God brings mercy. You know, he does. And when the victim needs help to go on, God provides that too. Now, Paul had himself received mercy, and the, he never forgot it. I mean, it, it got into the pore of his soul, and he never forgot it. But his but God encounter on that Damascus road uh, changed him forever. And this is what he writes uh, to Timothy, his young protege in the ministry. This is what he writes to him. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example. This is what you were saying about the blind man. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. You know, I met with someone just this last week in my office who were deeply troubled by a mistake in their past. And I tried to help her understand this but God had mercy concept. Uh, this moment at which Paul's past was behind him and he instead of looking back pressed on toward the prize of the high calling, pressed forward, free of guilt from his past mistakes. Now listen to me. Grace brings forgiveness, but it often does nothing for the guilt, the feeling of guilt a person feels. Only God's mercy can relieve me of that feeling of guilt. Have you had that but God moment in your life? A time when God stepped in and intervened to bring you relief? If not, why not? You can hit that pause button right now and you can ask him right now for mercy. This, this prayer request that is so often neglected and ignored, you can stop right now, right where you are. You can pull that car over, wherever you are, you can pause and ask God for his mercy. So we've talked about what is God's mercy. We've talked about uh, why do I need God's mercy. The final question is this, when do I get God's mercy? So when does this but God moment occur where you experience his mercy, his relief? Well, I can tell you they seldom, if ever, occur when things are going well. But God moments always come in times when we are usually out of options and our resources are depleted. And if God doesn't step in, we're done. We're toast. We are most aware of mercy as we face misery. But here's something very important to remember. Today's mercy, this is important, today's mercy is not designed to carry tomorrow's trouble. Today's mercies are for today's misery. Uh, Jesus tried to get us to understand that in Matthew chapter 6, 
verse 34, he said, Do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. You know, the strength you need to live tomorrow will be given tomorrow, not today. I can't emphasize too strongly in these days of such uncertainty how important it is for us to grasp this truth. We are prone to ruin today, worrying about tomorrow. We experience sickness, sorrow, sin, and we're prone to give in to the despair of, I thought I would die. I couldn't go on. I couldn't make it. God, write this in your note, God gives me mercy the moment I need it. God gives me mercy the moment I need it. And you might put over there, and not a moment before. You know, I'll never forget uh, what my evangelism professor said to me uh, my final semester in seminary. He had been diagnosed with leukemia, and Mark, you've heard me tell this story, but he'd been diagnosed with leukemia. Uh, His name was Dr. Thompson, and he was... um, he was not going to get well. He had been diagnosed, and he was terminal. And at the end of one of his lectures, he, he had become so weak that he sat to lecture and sat at the desk in, in front of us. And it was a small class. And so he just quit a little bit early, and he said, Does anybody got a question? And one of my brave colleagues, uh, their student, uh, addressed the elephant in the room. And he said, Dr. Thompson, how, how do you do this? How do you, knowing that you are terminally ill, come to this class day after day and teach? How do you do that? And uh, I'll never forget. I didn't write this down. It just is etched on my mind. Dr. Thompson said, first of all, we're all terminal. We're all terminal. He said, the only difference is I have a little better idea of how long I'm going to live than you do. But this is what he said. I'll never forget. He said, this is how I do it. God doesn't give dying grace on non-dying days. Hmm. And I love that. Mm -hmm. And you could just substitute grace for mercy. God doesn't give dying mercy on non-dying days. You know, God gives us the mercy we need exactly when we need it, and not a moment before. You, know, you say, what, what, what makes me believe that, that, that God will provide what we need when, when we need it? Well, God's Word tells me. And of all places, it's the book of Lamentations, okay? Lamentations, lamenting. It's a book of misery, really. And this is what we read. Solomon says, I mean, uh, Jeremiah says, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish For His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Why are God's mercies new every morning? Why does God do it that way? It's not because yesterday's mercies are faulty, but they were for yesterday's trouble. They are like tailor-made Uh, for today. They're like the manna in the wilderness. You can't keep it overnight. You can't stockpile mercy enough. You can't, you know, he gives us enough for one day at a time. Uh, And if you're not living that way, you're not living on God. You know, see, that's why the manna would be good for only one day, because God wanted the Hebrew people to come every day depending upon Him. God wants you and me to come every day depending upon His mercy that we so desperately need. You know, uh, it isn't the source of much of our misery that uh, we worry about tomorrow instead of trusting God for today. We look ahead and we anticipate the misery. How can I go on? I know from personal experience what those feelings are like. I thought I would die, but God had mercy. There are plenty of reasons to believe tough times may be coming, guys. We may well be heading into some choppy waters in the future. We don't know for sure. But if, in fact, we are, you can be certain of this one thing, but God will have mercy, and His mercy will be fresh every morning. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your mercy. It's hard to believe that we actually take it for granted. 
something that we need so much. I, I suppose it's like the air we breathe. We, we take that air for granted. And we take your mercy for granted. But today, Father, I pray that you would help us to reconfigure our prayer request so that we cry out to you on a daily basis for your mercy, not just for ourselves, but for others who are impacted, who need relief, your relief that you provide. And I pray, God, that you would help us to live in the consciousness of that mercy this week. And may we be merciful to those we see suffering. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week.